But the teachers of our life, they're not books. They are the very living essences of nature itself. What a strange person. Unbelievably powerful supercomputer that's running our reality, and we don't have a clue yep. as to how to operate it. So when maybe you or somebody else creates an AGI system, and you get to ask her one question, what would that question be? What's outside the simulation? Say in your mind, say to yourself, I am more than my physical body because I am more than physical matter. I can perceive that which is greater than the physical world. Broadcasting in New York, upstate near the Great Lakes, it's Lighting the Void. I'm your host, Joe Roop. We're live on the Fringe FM. Once again, it's Thursday night, September the 3rd. And if you're listening live for the first time here, the show comes to you every single night. Broadcasting live, 9 p.m. Pacific to 11 p.m. Pacific time. Right here on the Fringe FM. Prior to the Secret Teachings with Ryan Gable, David Matheson is back on the show. I want to thank... Uh, Daniel Alexa for coming on last night. What a cool guy he was. And some cool stuff coming down the line with that, too. Pretty intense stuff been happening here lately. And uh, uh, if you want to join the Patreon and support the show, it means the world to us here because that's how we continue to strive and we continue to do lighting the void and actually even the fringe fm until we get some other things going so um if you have any issues also with listening to the show always remember that we make sure that first and foremost that we're broadcasting on talk stream live and the paranormal radio app that will always be our feed there as well and then the others they fall behind those like tune in and stuff like that so um I kind of want to jump right into this because it's been a minute since we've talked to David Matheson. And now, if you don't know who David is, uh, he's been here a few times, and I love having conversations with him. And David Matheson has been exploring the connections between the myths and the stars for over 10 years and the evidence that worlds, ancient myths, scriptures, and sacred stories share a common foundation of celestial metaphor. He has written nine books and well over... 1,100 blog posts on the subject and as well as dozens of videos and has appeared on numerous podcasts and conferences to discuss the overwhelming evidence which demonstrates that the figures and events in the world's ancient myths are associated with specific constellations as part of a shared system of tremendous antiquity. And you can go to his website at starmythworld.com. David, it's good to have you back. Thanks for coming on, man. Thanks so much, Joe. I really appreciate the chance to talk with you i'm looking forward to it so what is the deal that's going on now with the stars and stuff like is there anything that you can see about what you've studied in your studies that explains all of this craziness and nonsense <laughs> that's going on well that's a great in <laughs> intro question joe <laughs> the uh 
my most recent book is called Myth and Trauma, and it talks about the evidence that the world's ancient myths are actually designed, they're speaking on many different levels, but one of their central messages has to do with recovery from trauma, but they've been used, you could even say hijacked, to inflict trauma as well. So whatever is going on, there's clearly more going on than meets the eye. I mean, there is no way that you can say, you know, <laughs> Nancy Pelosi went and got this haircut or, you know, I, I shouldn't mention her by name because I don't want to get into trouble with her contingent, but does she look like she's deathly afraid of catching <laughs> a virus? No, I mean, she doesn't. For all, sure. the, all the, all uh, the, all the, uh, news is about, well, was she set up? Was this a setup? Was this an ambush? It should really, the headline should be Nancy Pelosi bravely, courageously, you know, braves the, uh, <laughs> fearlessly gets her hair done <laughs> because she's putting herself at risk of deadly danger. Well, obviously she's not concerned with the deadly danger of, uh, of catching this, but yet they're making us all go around, wear a mask when we go into the grocery store, stand this far apart. And it doesn't look like uh, certain people are very afraid of it at all. And those are the people who are inflicting this on everybody else. So something is going on. We could argue about what's going on. And I don't, this subject's been beaten to death. I don't really want to go into it, but uh, just generally abstracting out, we are talking about the infliction of trauma, which has to do with polarizing people. We're clearly seeing people being polarized. But this also has to do, excuse me, I'm, <clears throat> I ate a bunch of almonds and now I got an you almond got in my throat. Dry throat, throat from almonds? Take yeah. a sip here. <laughs> I've yeah. got plenty of hot water sitting next to me, so sorry about that. But polarization of the people at large, I don't think you could argue that if someone were designing a policy in order to divide people, they could do much better than the kind of scenarios that we've been seeing play out, not just with coronavirus, but with a lot of other things. It's almost as if someone is deliberately trying to polarize people. Well, also on an individual level, the myths are about recovery of the self. And we can get into this on, you know, a very deep level. We'll start, maybe we'll start talking about what does it mean when I say the myths are all based on the stars? What does that even mean? And then we can get to what I'm talking about here. But there's a polarization that happens within an individual. And when we're polarized, when we have polarized parts of our own self warring against each other, which is also what we see going on on a national and a world scale, we are less able to get in touch with this essential self, this higher self, or we could even say this deeper self that the myths are actually talking about. That deeper self has to do with connection with others, compassion, courage, um, these are things that the most cutting edge healers and therapists are now talking about, but they're things that the ancient myths are also talking about. But when we're polarized, those polarized parts of us keep this essential self down and keep us from those kinds of connections and compassion and courage. And I am pretty convinced that polarizing the world polarizing the nation, polarizing the world, polarizing people against themselves. I mean, the internal divisions that the external divisions reflect the internal divisions that they're trying to inflict on people, because when they do that, we're less able to access the parts of us or actually our deeper self. That's not even a part. That's who we really are. That is about compassion and connection with others and that's, um, if that part comes to the fore, 
in too many people, it's going to thwart the the designs of people who want to inflict austerity and economic oppression and other things on on people. So they want to polarize. So <laughs> I didn't really expect to talk about that in my first uh, my first response to to tonight's discussion, but I think that's what's that's what we're seeing going on. And hopefully I can tie that into what I'm talking about with the connection of the ancient myths and what they're talking about. Yeah, because this I man, like I'm doing a radio show with Ryan after this and it's like I totally agree with you on that. It's I don't know if I don't know if it's people or some kind of dark force or something or whatever it is that just wants to separate everybody and separate anything that's good whole or any type of connection it just you can definitely feel it though especially especially here lately uh for me it's like ryan gable and i had this discussion it's like some type of diabolical force that just doesn't want good things for people it's like when those things start happening it, it kind of uh goes in and tests you or it deliberately manipulates you uh, some type of some type of elemental entity who knows what it is man it's definitely some type of spiritual war going on for sure though yeah i i do get into that actually in the book myth and trauma because i think this is an ancient struggle that's going on that goes back thousands of years and um uh i i don't know if it's i do think there are you know individual human beings who know the ancient systems. It's like if I were a psychologist and I knew about these things that I'm talking about, trauma and how to heal trauma, and I knew that really, really well, but I was malicious. And so when people came into psychotherapy, I actually used my knowledge to mess them up even more. I could be even more effective than just the average person on the street who didn't know all these things about psychology. That would be really, really evil to just mess people up on purpose who were coming in looking for help. But if I really understood the human mind and these, the concept of trauma and polarizing people to, to turn them even against their own self, I could really do some damage. And there's evidence that people do understand the ancient myths are actually about healing trauma but there's evidence that people who know the ancient myths are using them instead to inflict trauma for nefarious purposes which has to do with um oppressing other people and and uh and whether there's a spiritual component to that there i would i would argue there almost certainly is but understand you could you could even you know, strip the spiritual out and say, if somebody really understood psychology really well, that wanted to inflict trauma deliberately, they could do that. And we don't, this isn't speculation. We don't have to go back very far in history to see intelligence agencies and other governmental agencies actually doing programs to deliberately inflict trauma on people and say, well, let's see what happens when we do this and actually creating real major problems in people's psyches on purpose. So, <laughs> so I think you're absolutely right. You're, you're onto something very big there, Joe. Well, what do you, what do you think? Do you think that the stars and the constellations like literally have something to do with it? Honestly, like, uh, I don't know. Cause you hear about that stuff like star systems and all these different worlds, things like that. Do you, do you really feel there's any validation to that? So here's what I can show for sure, that the ancient myths from around the world are based on celestial metaphor. I can show that for sure with hundreds and hundreds of examples, probably going into the thousands of examples. And the more you look, the more evidence you can find. And it's not just speculation. You can see it in the texts themselves, in the textual evidence, you can also see it in the ancient artwork evidence. So I can say with complete confidence that the world's ancient myths are based on the stars. Now, what does that mean? 
Well, first of all, it means that they're all connected. So we have this paradigm that, you know, Christianity says, well, we're different from all the other pagan things. Those are all wrong. And we're talking about true events and they're talking about myths. Well, actually, we can show that the stories in the Bible from beginning to end are based on the stars, based on celestial metaphor, the very same system of celestial metaphor that's operating in ancient Egypt, the myths of ancient Egypt, the myths of ancient India, the myths of ancient Babylonia, Sumer, Mesopotamia, Akkad, the myths of ancient Greece, the myths of the ancient Norse, the myths of the Maya, the myths of Maui and the Polynesian cultures of the Pacific, the myths of ancient China, ancient Japan, ancient Africa. This is a pretty tremendous body of evidence that stands alongside all the other evidence of people that have been pointing out the archaeological evidence, like you've mentioned them on your show, John Anthony West, Robert Schock, uh, Robert Cassaro, Graham Hancock, pointing to archaeological evidence. Wow, it looks like there's some kind of ancient culture that predates ancient Egypt, that predates ancient India, that's extremely ancient, that's uh, that was somehow forgotten or somehow obliterated by some kind of cataclysm. But all the world's myths are based on some common system. And it's my opinion that the most likely explanation is they're descended from something even more ancient. So that's one, that's one um, conclusion we can take from this. But, but now you're asking, well, what does it mean? Why are they all... Why are they all basing their spiritual what some people might say well it's 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 possible that every you know every culture has access to the stars so they just all looked up at the stars well first of all that's kind of it's not something you would expect that every single culture on earth would just look up to the stars and say i'm going to base my spiritual traditions on the stars maybe one or two might do that but for every single one to do that that's not just coincidence Right. Most yeah. likely. Most likely. It's not just coincidence. But why are they doing that? And I would argue, I've looked, so I can prove that they're doing that. Why they're doing that, now we're getting into speculation where I can't prove for sure, but I've looked at this now for over a decade. I've thought about it a lot. And I am convinced that what they're doing is they're illustrating invisible things using visible stars and metaphors. It doesn't mean that the stars themselves are making things happen or that the gods are necessarily the constellations. What I'm, what I'm inclined to, the way I would put it would be, there are truths about the invisible world. We can get into that a little bit. They are explaining that through a system, a language of the stars, and they say, this set of stars is associated with Zeus. Same set of stars is associated with Thor. Same set of stars is associated with um, Indra in ancient India. It has certain characteristics. Zeus is a jovial god. He's jovial. Well, the word jovial comes from Jove, which is one of the names of Zeus. It's a more Latin name of Zeus, Jove. Zeus, Pater, Jupiter, jovial. Thor is also jovial. He loves a good feast. He loves ale. He loves giant, you know, steaks. <laughs> he likes to cook up the whole ox and eat all the steaks. But he has a very short temper. So this, this principle, this divine characteristic that has to do with that particular constellation has certain characteristics. Jovial but short-tempered, associated with things like thunder, Zeus is associated with thunder. Uh, Thor is associated with thunder, lightning, thunderbolts. Uh, the most powerful um, fighter of enemies like Titans in ancient Greece or Jotuns in the Norse myths. That characteristic is associated with a certain constellation. It doesn't mean that that constellation is Zeus. That constellation is a way for us to understand this principle that is an important principle to understand. So I don't know if this is a, is a long way of answering your question. I believe that the invisible realm is real. 
that it relates to things that are going on inside of us. Like I was talking about the suppression of the of our own essential self. I believe that we get connection to that invisible realm when we're connected to our self. That's when um, you can hear the the warnings of the gods. Like in the Odyssey, Odysseus will be going along and he'll be headed for an encounter with Circe who will completely defeat him if he just goes in on his own strength. But then the god Hermes shows up and says, um, Odysseus, you might want to pay attention before you go in and see Circe because she's going to turn you into an animal if you don't have the right antidote. And Odysseus is one of the characters who is attuned to the voice of the gods. It's just like Perseus. Perseus is going off to fight Medusa. And he thinks, hey, I'm, I am strong. I'm 21. I am the greatest warrior. I'm going to just go take care of Medusa. And the goddess Athena, along with Hermes, says, Perseus, you might want to listen before you go try and do that. So he's attuned to the voice of the gods, and he, he actually pays attention. Well, how do, we, how do we get that kind of inspiration from the invisible realm? I would argue it has to do with being connected to your, to your true self. That's how you get this inspiration that sometimes we can't even explain. And everybody's probably experienced it who's listening. So it is real. Um, you could say, well, it's just psychology. But there are instances where people get messages that you can't even explain as just coming from their subconscious. It's like a message from someone in another state or in another continent. And it turns out to have been, you know, true. That connection to that invisible realm is what they're trying to teach us in these myths. And it can be used for our benefit to, to achieve our full potential. Mm-hmm but it could also be used to, um, this knowledge could also be used to divide people. And I would argue that that is also what we see going on in the world stage where you do see what Christopher Knowles calls star magic. I don't know if you've ever interdu- uh, interviewed Christopher, Christopher Knowles, but yeah. he, shows, he shows evidence that there are groups that are using this ancient system to call out to the invisible realm. And the scary thing is he also shows evidence that they're, they're getting answers <laughs> and that's pretty, and they're scary not doing thought, it for, right? they're not doing it for good purposes. Right. But the good news is that we also have access to that invisible realm. There's, it's not like it's just for a certain group of people. It's, it's actually for the uplift of men and women. I would argue that the, the myths show that the gods work out their will through men and women and and that they're actually the myths are actually for it's actually supposed to be used for good purposes just like karate or kung fu could be used it could be used to protect people from violence or it could be used to bully people and it's it's clear from the myths that it's supposed to be used for positive uplifting purposes but that it can also be used for bad purposes and that's what i think is going on long answer to a really good question Star magic. That's pretty interesting. Um, Because I've I've read a few books about it myself, but not to the point to where it's been used for diabolical reasons. But I have no doubt in my mind that they are using things like that, playing with certain, I guess you could say, forces and times. And I mean, if alchemy or physical alchemy shows us anything, if anyone's ever like taken Phoenix Aurelius's course, you know, cause we promote it. We tell you to use the code word fringe. If anybody takes that course, you'll notice that when you do like Paracelsian's Bajiric alchemy, that certain types of tinctures and things will only work during certain alignments. It won't work during other alignments. So that's pretty much like physical proof that there's this world full of these metaphysical energies that have timing and understanding to them it's kind of weird though that it has been so hidden don't you think like why would it be hidden yeah (laughs) because i think it was hidden i think it had to go underground because it this was something that was 
at the heart of every ancient culture. This was given to every ancient culture as their original instructions, to use a term that I borrow from a great insightful scholar named Peter Kingsley, an inspired scholar named Peter Kingsley, and um, who wrote In the Dark Places of Wisdom. And he says, every culture has these original instructions. And they were given to to protect the people, to, you know, the gifts of the gods to a land, the, the water, the air, the, the sunshine, the crops, are all portrayed in the ancient myths as gifts of the gods, as is every single human child, you know, in the Greek myths, there's not a child who's born without the goddess Artemis being present and allowing that birth to happen. She's the one who mothers call out to when they're when it's time to give birth and they want to be delivered of that child that they've carried for nine months, uh, 40 weeks. They call out to the goddess Artemis, and she's the one who allows the child to be born, meaning that the most precious resource given to every land is the people that are born into it. And all those gifts of the gods are given, including the gifts that are given to men and women, gifts of musical talent or artistic talent or other kinds of abilities, engineering talent, whatever gifts are given, those are always portrayed in the myths as gifts of the gods. And when you forget that, tragedy always ensues in the myths. When a human says, oh, I'm a better artist than... Athena or I'm a better musician than Apollo. It's always a disaster because they're forgetting that that gift came from the realm of the gods. So these gifts of the gods are given to the people and these myths and these ancient instructions are given to each culture to preserve what's good and to to enable those gifts to, to benefit the people. But there are people who want to take that and take those gifts of the gods and for themselves instead of for the benefit of the people. And so they've stamped out this ancient wisdom. That's what I think has gone on. And I think uh, the evidence is pretty strong that that started to take place at least during the Roman Empire and the creation of this literalist interpretation of literalist Christianity um, was taking these ancient ancient wisdom that's good ancient wisdom and turning it into something that oh now it's a literal it's not esoteric anymore it's a literalist understanding and all the greek gods are suddenly oh they're all just demons we have to suppress them and we have to stamp out all this ancient wisdom that was given to all these different cultures and that's why it ended up going underground when you say why does it have to be secret had to be secret because during the Middle Ages, if you were practicing alchemy, you could be severely persecuted as, um, you know, consulting with demons or something. So literalist Christianity was a uh, form of stamping out or turning over the ancient wisdom, I would argue. Now, I'm not saying that the scriptures of the Bible are bad. I'm saying that the way they've been interpreted, they're actually full of truth and beauty, and that's why people are attracted to them mm-hmm. and their message. But I, I would say that, um, in my opinion, and I'm not trying to stamp on people's beliefs. Some people find truth and beauty, and they take them literally, and I took them literally for a very long time, and they were very positive influence in my life, but they also had negative influences, too. They do teach things about eternal damnation or uh, spare the rod, spoil the child. I know that verse is not in the Bible, but it does talk about the rod and, you know, punishing your children physically and um, Mm. different, different things about the roles of men and women and literalist interpretation of the scriptures, I would argue can definitely inflict trauma. And in general, it externalizes the message and says, oh, well, these people are descended from Moses or these, or you have to search for this external savior. That's an externalization of what's actually, these myths are actually talking about something that's going on inside of us. I would 
argue that by showing that these are all based on the stars, we can show that they're metaphorical. So, you, you know, <laughs> what I, you know, I think another thing too about the stars and the beautiful thing about the journey is like a lot of this stuff that happens in our lives when it comes to the archetypes and the mirrors and relationships and all the crazy stuff we go through. It's just what it, it's just like God, I feel trying to get us to accept us just accept who you are and the wholeness and accept everybody else in wholeness and like the plan is really heaven on earth and but we just keep going through these cycles and this is just my theory i don't know if i'm right or not but it feels that way based on all the people i talk to and all the stuff that they go through they're always in some form or phase of these constellations or even planetary energies. Uh, and the stories all kind of work differently in their lives, depending on the energies in their birth charts and their evolutionary astrology. It's a really a complicated thing when you look at it, but if you just look at like the 12 constellations and all of the, the initiatic stories behind them, that these stories continue to play out to get us to accept our own divinity, like who you really are. And then you learn to accept everyone else or vice versa. Like it's a constant struggle. You know what I'm saying? That is a great insight. So I've been, um, so my most recent book, Myth and Trauma, is relating to some of the most cutting edge healers today, like the teaching of Dr. Gabor Mate, who talks about trauma. He worked with people who have addictions and probably most of us have experienced having an addiction, not necessarily to a substance. It could be an addiction to shopping or mm -hmm. sex or anything that is something that you find to be damaging, but you can't get rid of it. And it, anyway, he found in dealing for uh, healing and working and trying to give therapy to people in a very um, addicted population in East Vancouver that almost, not almost, every person he worked with had trauma. And trauma is a separation from the self. And this relates to what you were just saying. So I talk about this in myth and trauma because it can be shown that the myths are actually dramatizing that separation from the self. You could call it the divine self. You could call it the higher self. And more recently, I've been exploring the work of another cutting edge therapist, doctor, psychologist named Dick Schwartz, Dr. Richard Schwartz, who founded IFS, the internal family systems model. And he's dealt with thousands of people, men and women that he has helped. And he finds that in every single person he's met, there is this indestructible self that actually knows how to heal. But that self can be suppressed when we are divided from self. It gets suppressed, but there's very specific things that happen to, to divide us from self. I can talk about that in a minute, but I just introduced that concept in response to what you just said, because it's really beautiful how you said it. We, we're actually, our addictions and depressions and anxieties and self-sabotaging behavior stem from this division from who we really are. And we get divided from who we are by trauma. Trauma right. is division from the self. And the myths show trauma. There's absolutely no doubt. I can walk you through the story of Adam and Eve, for instance, and show trauma being dramatized in the story of Adam and Eve. And the recovery of self is what the myths are all about. And that recovery of connection with who we are, that's what we're seeking. And self is indestructible, but it's been suppressed. When we divide from it, it's, there's, a, there's a whole series of, of mechanisms that cause us to divide from self without even knowing it. And so the myths are showing, hey, you don't even realize it, but you have this you have this going on in your life, unless you're really, really lucky. If you were raised in a really 
a really uh, ideal situation, you may have less trauma or no trauma. But we are living in a traumatizing society where we do get divided from self. And the good news is that the myths are all about pointing us how to get back, recover that self. And that's exactly what you were expressing. So I'm, I really love the way you said it. That, that's absolutely right. And that leads to connection with others or, or uh, empathy with others or curiosity with, oh, well, what happened to you? Hmm. I, you know, I understand what that is like. But when we're, when, we're, when we're taken over by these kind of additional programs that are like running on our screen, like we have 30 programs running on the screen, and we're like, why is my computer acting so funny? Well, <laughs> this program over here that uh, is, is taking over what's going on, it keeps us from that kind of connection with self. And that's when we tend to do these kind of polarizing things like, um, getting really defensive and getting really hostile and getting our triggers or our buttons pushed. Like when someone cuts us off on the freeway, we start going into a rage for like five minutes yelling at the, yeah, yeah, right, dr- right. at the windshield. And we're, and afterwards we're like, wow, who was that? What was that? Why was I talking like that? That guy couldn't even hear me. And it's like something took over a program took over my brain. That's, that's not self. That's something else. That's trying. It's trying to do something positive, but it's actually, it's actually going to mess you up. If self can, if the more we can get into self, the less those kinds of, we, the less we get played like a puppet. But if, but if someone wants to play you like a puppet, then they don't want you in self. They want you in those. They want those little programs taking over. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah. Yeah, like um, that's what I'm saying. Like you, we have a heart. We we have to accept. A lot of times, they don't want whatever this thing is. It doesn't want you accepting you. Like if I, I'm, I guess I'm just gonna go back to that, right? It doesn't want you accepting you, and it doesn't want you to accept others for the way they are. And it damn sure doesn't want you to come together. Um, and these connections that you were talking about when you first started the show. Again, I'm just baffled by how synchronistic the show is to the actual things that happen in my life. It's crazy. And this tells me another thing, David, that uh, when you read the book Ecclesiastes and they talks about there's nothing new under the sun, eat, drink, and be merry, right? Like appreciate everything you have and learn to live life because the plan is heaven on earth. That these stories that just keep playing out over and over again happen for a reason because they're trying to get you to see who you are all right that's that's what i think and um i don't know man it's just like a whole big realization all of this stuff i think Uh, whatever they're doing is backfiring on them well yeah i think that if everybody's in self or the more people are in self the more they're going to set up a more compassionate and inclusive and um, less divisive, less polarized society. And that, um, that doesn't lead to exploitation very easily. And so, yeah, I mean, we're talking about a lot of kind of deep end. We jumped right into the deep end. Um, that's what I do. If you, I always do <laughs> that's that great. Stuff, I like it. <laughs> I mean, I'm comfortable there in the deep end. I don't want to leave anyone behind is what I'm saying. If we threw, sure. if we threw all the audience right into the deep end, David's saying um, you don't want to leave you shallow people behind. That's what he's saying. No, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> but, but some people, no, some I'm, people I'm may not be familiar with, you, with my work. I'm just, I'm just playing. <laughs> I know, I know. But if, but if somebody's like, what is this guy talking about? Myths and stars. I mean, we can build up to it a little bit just to kind of explain. I mean, we have touched on it a little bit, but some examples, the myths are clearly based on the stars. And then I can, I can show you a few examples of that. And the stars are speaking. It's almost like there's a language associated with the stars. And that is explaining to us how we get back in touch with ourself. It shows a division from self and then a recovery of self. And that's what's going on in these myths. And 
they can be shown to be based on the stars, like from first to last. Like I was mentioning the the story of Adam and Eve. Before the before the dreaded fall, they are naked and unashamed. So right. what does that mean? That means they're, they they accept themselves. They're not even worried. They about accept it. themselves. That's right. They they're comfortable in their own skin. Mm-hmm. But after <laughs> after the fall, they're no longer comfortable in their own skin. They're like, man, I got to cover myself up here. And we talk about someone being comfortable in their own skin and not being comfortable. And which would we rather be? Would we rather be the person who's kind of always feeling like they're not enough? Having to, yeah. They're, uh, I'm, 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 I'm trying to cover up certain parts of me. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not, you know, I'm not really worthy. I'm playing. I feel like I'm faking it. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm a faker, but, uh, or would you, we want to be the kind of person who's really integrate. We all know people who are comfortable in their own skin. Mm-hmm. They are, and they're confident and they, they, they make us calm to be around them rather than they make us on edge. But then there's this fall that happens. And then that can be shown to be based on the stars. The serpent is cast out of heaven first. And the constellation that plays the role of the serpent sinks down into the West first before the constellation that plays the woman and before the constellation that plays the man. First, the serpent, Hydra, the constellation Hydra is what I believe is the serpent in the story. He sinks down into the West and he's told he's going to crawl on his belly. He's going to eat the dust of the ground. And, And the constellation Hydra, you can see as it sinks down into the West, it looks like it's eating the dust of the ground. Then the woman, the constellation Virgo, that's right next to Hydra, she gets cast out of the heavens and she's told, oh, you're going to have pain in childbirth or your travail of labor will be greatly increased. And the constellation Virgo looks like she's giving birth. The actual constellation is lying on its back with the feet elevated and apart, which is how a woman gives birth. Yeah. And then she sinks down into the ground. Then the man, he's told, oh, from dust you came and unto dust you will return. You rose up from the eastern horizon. You rose up in the east, just like the sun does. You rose up from the dust. And then after a while, after traveling across the sky, you returned to the dust. You sank back down to the dust. And then it's told that a angel appeared in the east of Eden with a flaming sword. So as those constellations that represent Adam and Eve and the serpent sink down, then there's a constellation that rises in the east, the east of Eden. That's the constellation Perseus that has a flaming sword that turns in all directions, that turns in all directions. So, and and I'm not the first person to do that particular explication of the story of Genesis. That was actually Robert Taylor who was a reverend in the early 1800s, but it, I'm just showing it from the text. I could also show you pictures, but we're doing this verbally, so I'm giving you some textual examples. But that constellation with the flaming sword that turns in all directions can be shown to line up with the constellation Perseus that is rising in the east, the east of Eden, when Adam and Eve are sinking down in the west, and also in other myths around the world, like in the Norse myths there's this story of ragnarok ragnarok you're familiar with that right everybody's heard of the thor movie yeah ragnarok the thor ragnarok ragnarok is the like the judgment day the doomsday the twilight of the gods it's been translated in in german they call that gotterdammerung i'm not sure that might be a mistranslation actually twilight of the gods but it is this forecast end of the age when all the gods of the Norse myths are going to be basically devoured by the forces of chaos. And one of the forces, one of the leaders of the forces of chaos is a figure called Surt. And he has a flaming sword, just like the angel in the Garden of Eden, whose flaming sword is described in the end of Genesis 3, chapter 3. It's the same constellations creating the same patterns throughout the myths of the world. So what are they talking about? Well, on one level, they are talking about our own 
division against ourselves because after they're thrown out of Eden, Adam and Eve are now disconnected from God. They're also disconnected from nature. They're told, up oh, from now on, <laughs> you know, that the earth isn't going to give you free food anymore. Now you're going to have to work by the sweat of your face to grow food. Mm-hmm. And you're divided from nature. You're divided from each other. You know, they used to be naked and unashamed. And now, you know, afterwards, it's like, who, who, who told you to eat from the tree? Oh, she did it. You know, they're, they're already divided yeah. against each other. Yeah, they're already Adam's like blaming each other. It's her fault. She beguiled me. You know, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so they're divided, and, and they're divided from themselves. We yeah. see that because they're now ashamed of who they are. And so that whole story is showing division uh, from ourself. And, and there, are modern, there are modern psychologists who talk about trauma who say, uh, Dr. Peter Levine in this book, Healing Trauma, has a quotation I love, and he says, trauma... In short, trauma is about loss of connection to ourselves, to our bodies, to our families, to others, and to the world around us. That's a direct quote from Peter Levine in his book, Healing Trauma. He's one of the kind of pioneers of trauma psychology. Um, He talks about how it wasn't even really talked about when he went to medical school, but during the 70s when people were coming back from Vietnam and they had traumatic stress, that's when the field started to recognize the importance of trauma. And trauma means what he just said, loss of connection to ourselves. And that includes loss of connection to our bodies and to our families. And you see this in the Garden of Eden, to others, to, to people around us, just like what you were talking about, you know, dividing people up now we're divided by race or by gender or by, you know, we can, it's like we're slicing and dicing even more and more and more to divide yep. people up even more. Let's Income, divide even you know, subdivisions bracket. from that. Yep. Right. Yep. And then to the world around us, to the, to nature, to the animals of the earth, to the plants, to the universe, even to the invisible realm. If we're divided against ourselves, we're not going to be in touch. But if we are, if we reconnect with ourselves, we can get all that back. And that's the good news that these healers like Gabor Mate and Richard Schwartz and Peter Levine explain is the good news is the trauma isn't what happened to you. Because if that were true, you can't go back to when you were three years old and fix it. The trauma is you're disconnected from yourself. And because that's true, you can always reconnect with yourself because yourself never goes away. How could it? Your essential self is still right there. And the myths are talking about that. So when they talk about divine twins, which is found around the world in all these different myths, one twin is mortal, one twin is divine. We find that in Castor and Pollux and the Greek myths. We find that in Gilgamesh. We find that in Gemini energy. Yeah, all over. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Gemini. Even Hercules or Heracles has a has a twin brother. Not many people know that. Jesus and has a twin. So, uh, or Jacob and Esau are twins. They're talking not about two different people. They're talking about yourself and you can recover that connection. So that's, uh, that's the good news. <laughs> so I talked a lot there. No, well, I mean, I, I'm, I just got to tell you, like, I just done an astrological report uh, to the Patreon. And I do like, you know, I go through the houses and I do astrological energy. And if I remember correctly, you know, it showed Venus and Gemini. And I want to believe, I forget which house it was in, but I was saying the exact same things. It's like, now it's time to identify that twin energy in you. So you're either being shown what you want or what you don't want. You know, you're, you're being shown what you want, like by what you don't, by either by what you don't want or by what you do, or you, you got both in your life. It's time to really identify with yourself, like who you, who do you want to be around? What do you want to connect to? Right? Like that's what it's, that's what we, um, I think we manifest in our lives in a lot of situations, even, I know this is going to sound totally wackadoo, but even like when we're born, people are like, well, how could I pick this family or whatever? They were so terrible to me, you know? 
but that family was there to mirror things, I guess, to get you to accept yourself. You know, think about it. If you didn't go through those struggles, you wouldn't accept who you really are. And I don't just mean like in a, a level comparative to society. I mean, deep down in your soul, accept who you are and love yourself and see your own power. That's not easy to do, right? Sounds easy, but it's not. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it would be much better for society if we had a lot less trauma. I think it's, it's bad to have uh, children being traumatized. Which yeah, for unfortunately, sure. this this society definitely does. With, and I'm not saying that parents are deliberately doing it. If they're, you know, we have this economic stress where. Uh, you know, parents aren't just working two jobs anymore. <laughs> they have to work three jobs to try and put food on the table or a roof over the head. But, um, and that, that causes, uh, that causes separation from the children and, and all, and, and we have this kind of, we've been atomized and blasted apart to where, uh, you know, if you think about a, a hunter gatherer society, let's just imagine, you know, if the father's off hunting or gone on a, a long trip or gets, you know, killed in battle or something. There's lots of uncles and aunts around and grandfathers and, and uh, you know, other adults that are, that are all looking out for the child. But today it's like, it, it, you know, if dad is off on a business trip, there's not, there's often, you know, the, uh, the nearest uncle may live in another state um, because of the, the economic and kind of the atomization that we have. But, uh, the the acceptance of yourself or this reconnection with yourself it might sound you know people might be listening saying mm, this sounds pretty new agey and i'm not even sure yeah. i have a higher self what is this higher self come on yeah, yeah, yeah. so one of the things about the ancient myths is they show skepticism of the higher self they show that people have to because going back to these modern cutting edge pioneering therapists, they explain that we disconnect from ourself without even knowing it. This will happen without your even knowing it. When you're little, if there are traumatic things going on, you will suppress who you are without even being aware that you're doing it because it's a survival mechanism. When you're two, or three, you must attach to your parents because right. you, or when you're one, you are programmed to attach to the adults who are there because you can't survive. And there's no six month old that can just survive, you know, on their own. So if there is, let's say your father is always yelling at your mother or even worse, beating your mother or beating the children, the child still must attach to the parents and it is more threatening to to the child which is more threatening this is something i heard from another psychologist dr lawrence heller says it is more threatening for the child to think my parents are bad my parents are totally unpredictable violent a danger to everyone around them than to say there's something wrong with me if I do better, I will be more accepted. That's the, the actually, that's less threatening to the child to say than to accept there's something wrong with my dad. They'll, ex they'll say, there's actually something wrong with me. And if I do better, I will be, I will be safe. And so, because that's something I can control. Oh, I man, can't, I hate that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I know it's, exactly it's what horrible, you're talking about. Right? It's horrible, but this is what psychologists talk about. See, I can't control this, you know, this grown man who's running around being violent. I can't control that. So I can control, I will criticize myself. I will suppress whatever I was, these, these actual parts of who I am, and we won't even know we're doing it. So the ancient myths actually show, I can show you ancient myths where this trauma is actually dramatized. Yeah. Like there's a myth of a child who's um, in, in the Indian uh, Puranas, who uh, the, the Bhagavata Purana, who wants to climb on his father's lap and then 
the stepmother says, no, you can't, you can't sit on his lap. And she like smacks him down and the father doesn't say anything. And the child is very hurt. Because the father doesn't the, say anything. Because yeah. the father doesn't say anything. It is dramatizing that exact attachment injury is what psychologists sometimes call it an attachment wound, a psychological, because he's trying to attach and he's being smacked down. They are dramatizing that and they show that is how we suppress the higher self. But the solution is to realize that we've actually suppressed our higher self. But if we don't even know that we have suppressed our higher self, because we want to suppress that that's happened because it's so painful, we don't even want to admit that that happened. We want to say, oh, I actually had a pretty good childhood, you know? It wasn't that bad. Yeah, it was it all wasn't that bad. right. I know people have had worse, but we don't even want to accept the possibility that that might have happened to us, that we might have suppressed ourself. So the myths talk about recovering ourself. The first step is to even understand that that happened to you. But the, the, your actual self is right there. But these other voices come in and keep you from it. They, you take on the critical voice of your mother or the critical voice of your father. You'll internalize that and use that to criticize your own self because you're trying to do better. Yeah. And, and or ruin a good voice, relationship in your life. It's just stupid, man. I, I, it's not stupid. Okay. It's just, it's a waste of good things. I think, you know what I mean? But, yeah. but we can fix it. Yeah. I mean, it's horrible. And so we want, we would want a society where less of that is going on, where, where parents are like informed of these dynamics and they understand, Hey, you know, this two year old, is not 18. I can't treat them like they're in the army, you know, or this three-year-old, like I was in the army and I got all this army training. And, uh, that's, that's one thing when you're 18, 19, 20 to have, Hey, it's time to toughen up. Well, they tell you you you, you can't use that on a two-year-old. What do they tell you when you first go in the army? I'm not your mommy or your daddy. I ain't none of those people. There were those people are gone, you know? So, but, but it's, uh, it would be better if we had a non-traumatic. So, because then if you're secure in who you are and you're connected to yourself, then you can handle the stress when you're an adult, because we're all going to face stressful stuff when we're an adult. But it's, but if, if people were taught this, you know, at the, at the parental level, we might have more people growing up that are connected to who they are. But anyway, what I'm trying to show is that this isn't a bunch of, uh, you know, very hazy stuff about, oh, you have a higher self. No, we have an authentic self that has been suppressed, that we did, that, that we did it out of a, a, a defense mechanism. And the myths show this. And, uh, and the, there's lots of myths that show up, but the one that I use the most is the story of doubting Thomas. When Jesus shows up, Thomas says, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> that that's not possible. I, uh, I've been burned a few times before by people telling me something that's too good be, to be true. And I bought into it. That's the doubting voice. We all have these different voices. These different parts is what the internal family systems of Richard Schwartz calls it, which I, I really think his people should check out his stuff. These doubting parts, they're not doing something bad. They're trying to protect you but they're actually protecting you from yourself. They're like, oh, no, no, no. That self let us down when we were babies. We got we to gotta suppress that self. That self is what causes us problems. So when Doubting Thomas doesn't let the other apostles tell him that Jesus is back, Jesus is the higher self. He's the essential self that comes back. All these myths are dramatizing how to get back in touch with the self. And Jesus doesn't tell Thomas, oh, you bad disciple. That's no. because our parts are actually, those are important parts of who we are. They're just, they're just misled or they're just trying to do a role that they're not supposed to be doing. And the self actually knows how to fix it. And so that's the way we, so actually when you can separate that part out, you can get back in touch with self and, and, like healers like Richard Schwartz show that happening with patients. You can listen to him doing kind of therapy 
on some podcast where he's talking to somebody and saying, now, how do you feel towards that part of yourself? And the, and the person they're talking to says, ah, oh, I feel really disgusted at their weakness. You know, I, I hate that weakness. Well, there's a part of us that that's a, that's a part that developed to like, like the Cobra Kai school, like to hate yeah. weakness, like, eh. and, and yeah. Richard Schwartz says, hey, <laughs> yeah. let's just ask that part. Let's just ask that Cobra Kai instructor. Could you please step aside for a moment? And when that happens, a different, the person's voice almost takes on a different quality. The person relaxes because what's happening is this, those parts obscure and press down the self. And this is what all the myths are showing about the, the God that gets buried, the, or the goddess that gets buried. In the case of Inanna, uh-huh. they have to go down to the underworld. That's the, I'm not saying that your higher self is a God, but I'm saying these myths are showing the suppression of yourself and then how that can be repaired. Does that, does any of that make any sense at all? Yeah, totally. That totally. I mean, this is just amazing to me that we're even talking about this. Uh, I had a pretty long discussion today about this as a matter of fact, but we do got to take the top of the hour break. We're David Matheson and, uh, you guys, uh, I'm, sure you're digging this i know if you love the show you love talking about the stars and the stuff this ain't up there for no reason by the way we'll talk a little more about that with david matheson right when we come back stay with us interesting guests, and a humble host, Shari's journey through the esoteric. Hey, Joe Roop, thanks for having us along for the ride. Thank you so much for a delightful evening. Well, I got a lot of ground to cover. Sure, you have a great product, but did you know thousands of times a day, advertisers try to get in your head and you really don't remember the product or the service? The Draw Shop knows your message needs to be watched and understood to convert viewers into buyers. The Draw Shop produces powerful, animated, and affordable videos. Single-person businesses working out of a converted garage to Fortune 500 companies have used the Draw Shop to make videos that are impossible to be misunderstood. Whiteboard animated videos turn viewers into buyers and believers using proven neuroscience, psychology, and highly refined marketing knowledge. Viewers take action. And with a compelling animated video from the Draw Shop, conversions are three to five times the national average. The Draw Shop. Call 844-619-3729 or visit thedrawshop.com. That's thedrawshop.com. I'm Clyde Lewis. You are listening to The Fringe FM. Abnormal News. I'm Brad Bernards. So you think 2020 has been a crazy year? (laughs) But wait, there's more. An asteroid is headed toward Earth. NASA says it is predicted to pass near our planet on November 2nd, one day before the presidential election. Sure, why not? That's courtesy Fox News. TheVerge.com reports this so-called dangerous asteroid, dubbed 2018 VP1, has a 0.41% chance of crossing paths with Earth on November 2nd, incredibly low odds. And even if it did take a turn and hit us, no one would be in danger. The asteroid is a measly 2 meters, or 6.5 feet across, making it slightly smaller than a compact smart car. If it did hit our atmosphere, it would completely disintegrate up above us. For reference, much larger satellites and space debris enter our atmosphere from time to time, burning up above us without affecting anyone on the ground. 
The BBC reports that local officials in Florida have approved the release of 750 million mosquitoes that have been genetically modified to reduce local populations. RT America's John Huddy. A U.S.-owned British-based company called Oxitec created the modified mosquito named OX5034 and describes its project as friendly mosquito technology, explaining that its mosquito has been altered to produce female offspring that die in the larval stage before hatching and growing large enough to bite and spread disease. The green lighting of a pilot project after years of debate drew a swift outcry from environmental groups who warned of unintended consequences. There's more news at paraabnormalradio.com. I'm Brad Bernards, Paraabnormal News. Is that a new music app? Yeah, check it out. Surfer Music Discovery. It links to thousands of online stations, but the twist is you see the song names and artists that are now playing live. That's different. No guessing. Looks like a waterfall of music. So many formats. Rock, oldies, country, R&B, jazz, and a whole lot more. How's that spelled? Surfer. S-U-R-F-R. Is it expensive? It's free. No need to sign up or sign in. Get the Surfer Music app free from Google Play or the App Store. The truth is out there. There's something out here. And so are we. KTOK Digital Broadcasting, The Fringe FM. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. that up from originally from the deep south at least for now huh tonight our guest is david matheson if you want to call in it's 1-800-588-0335 talk to us about these star myths look i believe in what david is saying i don't think um you know and even david was telling me during the break he's like look i'm not trying to be anybody's therapist or anything but it's this you know what i've come to think realize david about uh spirituality and metaphysics and all this stuff is like uh i don't know a lot of people we get into spirituality we talk about uh, you know the higher self and light bodies and all this stuff but i really think that it is just the biggest part of it is just being genuine and and uh accepting who you are right like the adam and eve story you talked about yeah, it's a huge, I mean, like I was saying earlier, do we want to be someone who's comfortable in our own skin? Do we want to have, do we want to be in our life led by our essential self, our true self? Do we want to be connected to that and have that part of us, not even part of us, that essential essence leading us? Or do we want to be led by um, kind of the doubting Thomas part of us or the critic part of us 
that all these different parts that are playing these different roles and all those parts, you know, I was mentioning the system of IFS of Dick Schwartz. Those are essential. We all have our own different unique parts that are all wonderful, but they're like the players on a basketball team. Each player has different talents and different skills, but they're not the coach. And if the players don't trust the coach, let's imagine, you know, NBA finals or, or playoffs are going on right now. Imagine a basketball team with a bunch of really talented players, but they don't trust the coach and they lock him in the basement or they lock him in the locker room. And they're like, that coach let us down. We've got to step up and be the coach, but they're not ready to be the coach. <laughs> What they really yearn for is a coach who can pull them all together and draw out what's best in each one of them right. and, br and bring that team to really achieve its potential. But if they're all bickering and fighting with each other because now they don't have a coach and this guy's trying to lead or that guy's trying to lead and they're all <laughs> like in the movie The Warriors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that movie. I'm showing my age and they're all like, I want to be war chief. Hey, big guy swans war chief and they're all fighting over <laughs> who's gonna be war chief yeah what they that. really want what they really want is a really capable leader who can bring out the best and make the whole team work together mm. well that's that's what we want for our life like we have all these different parts of ourselves that are actually wonderful we have a creative part we have a a tender part we have a a leader uh, or a, a you know an achieving striving part but really what they really all want is to be led by self. But if self, for some reason, they, they have to lock self up because they've been traumatized and they have to reject self. They've been forced to suppress self and lock it in the basement. Now they're all up there squabbling like a bunch of kind of immature players, all very talented, but they don't know how to run the team. It's going to be a disaster. What they really are yearning for is for that self to come back and lead them. Well, anyway, which would we really, really rather want for our life? It, for that in and of itself, yes, traveling in the light body and being able to have out-of-body experiences, all those things are wonderful. And actually, I would argue that those, the 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 doorway to those is being yourself. reconnection with the self. Your reconnection with the self is how you... That's how you reach out to the wider universe. That's how you hear the voice of the gods. That's how you get inspiration. When you get a inspiration in your dream, where did that come from? Well, it didn't come from your conscious mind, did it? It came from somewhere else. It came from, because your conscious mind was asleep. So just that in and of itself, having your life led by self, we can all actually have that. But what we mostly are probably experiencing experiencing in our lives is that basketball team that's all each different part is trying to be the leader but none of them are really and they're all kind of like becoming little tyrants and bickering with each other if we could just reconnect with self that in of itself is a miracle that is a miracle and as they say in the warriors miracles are the way things are supposed to be yeah. <laughs> miracles is what it's supposed to be and and then all those other things all those connections with the invisible realm those come from that but that has to that's the first step and that in and of itself is a miracle and if we could just have that that is a big deal and who wouldn't want that for their life like i um, would yeah man uh, you know like we do the astral journal uh on the patreon um i think it's like level two or three where we have like a video where we talk about the the out of body experience and we're all trying to go back to basics to get out of body right and um I, i'm taking them back to when i first had that crazy out of body experience and you know what the more you talk about this the more i realize that at that moment in time in my life I was being exactly who I wanted to be. You know what I'm saying? Like there was no chasing anything or hoping or wanting for, I was just being who I wanted to be and exploring what I wanted to explore. And I had an out of body experience. So I'm, I'm pretty sure there's something to what you're saying about that. I think there's something to it. 
That's just my theory, though, brother. Telling us, yeah, no, I, I, I am convinced that that's what the myths are actually talking about, and and showing us in the in the myths whether you're you whether you want to use the myths of ancient Greece, whether you want to use the myths of ancient India, whether you want to use the stories in the Bible, they are all actually expressing and dramatizing the same truths with different stories or the Tao Te Ching or the uh, myths of ancient Japan. They're all dramatizing the same, the same truths using different stories. It's like, Oh, you didn't get it with this story. Okay. Let me try it again with this one. That, and that's what there's, there's, there's a great quotation that I love to use from Alvin Boyd. Kuhn. Bible is a story of everyone's, uh, I'm quoting it from memory, so I'm not going to say it exactly right, but it's, it's a story of your here and now. It's not about ancient kings and ancient princesses or ancient warriors or anything else. It's about you. And until each and every reader recognizes himself or herself to be the central figure in any story, you're not going to grasp its full power. How do we, how do we do that without feeling selfish or uh, that's the thing like I understand what you're saying but it, after a while it starts feeling like at least for me mm-hmm. and this is probably because of my upbringing right that it feels like you're just being selfish that you're only caring mm-hmm. about yourself and you only focus on yourself but mm-hmm. uh, that's not true but I think that's a message that people get the second they actually do start wanting to do things for themselves or becoming themselves. I call it the hornet's nest, right? Where you're trying to move on and become yourself and connect to the higher self. And there's these like hornets, you know, how they try to tag you as you're running yeah. away from the nest, right? But they, they continue to tag you and eventually they'll give up. But it doesn't feel like you're ever going to get away from it, you know? Um, yeah, well, that's a great that's a great question. I'm not talking about an individualistic, like we have a very radical individualistic society that right. we're, yes. that we're living yeah. in here in, in the year 2020 in the United States or in other countries. Uh, this is a very individualistic, like it's all about me. And, and so I'm not actually, uh, condoning that. Like the quotation that I read from Peter Levine, where he said, in short, trauma is about loss of connection to mm. ourselves, to our bodies to our families, to others, and to the world around us. And when we're traumatized, then we're dis- we disconnect from our families, and we disconnect from others, and we disconnect from the world around us. When we reconnect with ourself, we actually, that opens us up, I would argue, to more ability to connect to others. But, yeah. but you also said, well, how do we do that without being selfish? Like, let me, let me give in a couple uh, examples that just come to me off the top of my head. Like, I, I don't have all this prepared. I'm, I'm, well, I'm going with, so we're e- I'm going we're with your, yeah, I'm going with your questions and trying to, re- I, I think that's the beauty of a conversation. Every person that I talk to is going to bring different perspective and bring out different, different angles. So yeah. you're asked, I feel kind of selfish if I'm reading you know, you said that that uh, that Alvin Boyd Kuhn quote about, well, we don't grasp its full power until we realize it's about us. Well, I could see how that get, could get taken the wrong way, but let's let's look at it the other way. Let's look at let's look at the story of Samson, or the story of Solomon. These are figures who Solomon is well known as the what? What was his great gift? He's the He's the wizard, King Solomon. Man. Yeah, he's, he's talking about the, the wisest. Wise man, yeah. Exactly. He's he's the wisest who ever lived. In fact, he was asked. He had a vision. Actually, he had a. If you read First Kings three, I'm pretty sure it's First Kings three. He uh, goes up on a high hill and does these sacrifices. Actually, it says like a thousand bulls in one day or something like some enormous number that's hard to even imagine literally taking place, but. We won't get into that. And then he goes right into a vision and he slept and he had a dream and God asked him, what would you want? Ask me anything. Ask me whatever you want. And Solomon says, well, I feel like I have this tremendous responsibility. 
I'm trying to govern this entire people, but I feel like a child. You know, I just don't feel up to the task. Why don't you give me, since you've asked me what you, what, what I want, could you please give me wisdom to help others, to judge rightly, to make the right call? That's what I need. So this answer pleases the Lord is what the text tells us. And he says, because you asked for that, you didn't ask for long life. You didn't ask for riches. You didn't ask for the life of your enemies, implying you can actually go to the divine realm and ask for selfish things. You could even ask for harm, harm to happen to other people. That's what that implies to me, that that's one of the things he could have asked for. Mm -hmm. But no, you asked for wisdom, not just wisdom, but wisdom to help others. And I'm going to give you a wise and understanding heart. And so it says that Solomon was given wisdom beyond anyone else. And us reading that as if it's a literal story might say, well, hmm, Solomon lived, I don't know, a thousand BC or some sometime thousands of years ago at least. That's great. And he's the wisest who ever lived. That's great. What? How does that help me? It doesn't really help me that much. It's, it's about him. Yeah, it's his just a wisdom. history story. Real cool story. Yeah, how does it help me? I got you. But actually, if you understand, that's, we can actually, that's what we should be going to the invisible realm for, is for wisdom to help others. You could ask for other things, but it's really about wisdom. And that wisdom is actually available to you. Your higher self, your divine self, or your essential self it actually knows what to do. If you trust in yourself, it's the one that sticketh closer than a brother. In Proverbs, there's a verse that says, there is a one that is closer even than a brother. I would argue that's talking about your higher self. Yeah, It's not something external. But there's also kings like King Midas. King Midas is actually asked, what would you like? He's in the Greek myths. And he says, more money. <laughs> <He says. laughs> yeah. Right. He's already a king. He's presumably got just about every need that he could possibly want fulfilled. If he wants, you know, anything, he just has to ask for it because he's the king of this whole land. But he says, I want everything I touch to turn to gold. Well, there's obviously something wrong with Midas. There's something a little bit off about someone who's already the richest, <laughs> presumably the king, but he doesn't have enough. He's got a hole inside of him that's yearning, and he makes a foolish choice. We soon learn that he regrets his decision. Now, we could say, aha, another king lived thousands of years ago. What a knucklehead. What a fool. He made a bad choice. No, that's actually about us, too. We have that same tendency. Like, what is addiction if not, like, never being satisfied, no matter how much you get, it's still not enough. That's what he's modeling. He's modeling like that hunger inside that can never be satisfied, like because there's something off. Greed with and Midas. gluttony, basically. Yeah, like it's it's it, uh, extreme and balanced. And well, we actually all <laughs> we all act it. like Midas, and we all act like Solomon, or we all have the potential to act like Midas. We all have the potential to act like Solomon. We all have the potential to act like Samson. Samson is the strongest man who ever lived. And you might say, well, that's not me. I can't bench press 5,000 pounds like Samson or push down walls or whatever. No, well, Samson acts very foolishly. He basically allows his appetites to lead him around. This is a dramatizing things about us. So I would say it's not selfish to look at that story and understand this is actually trying to teach you something. And when you go yeah. to church, that's what the preacher will usually do with a story is say, now, by the way, Jonah was running away and he wanted to get as far away as he could. Well, isn't that a picture of you and me? And that's right. That's the right way to understand it. These stories are about you and me. So I would say it's not, you could see it as selfish to, to, to understand it this way, but if they're all based on the stars, which I can show you that they're based on the stars, we're all connected. Then I would argue, yeah, yeah, they're not. Yeah, they're not literal. If I can show you King Solomon in the stars, 
I can show you the story of Solomon's choice. You know, he has this big, the judgment of Solomon where he has to choose. Two women come to him. It's actually right after he asked for wisdom. Two women come to him, each with a baby, two mothers, and he has to decide which one belongs to which baby. That's another, it's esoteric. It actually has these deep messages to us about the two mothers is a pattern that we find throughout mythology. We find two two mothers in um, that story I was telling you about, the, the child who tried to climb up on his father's lap from the myths of ancient India. That child's name is Dhruva. And his father, the king, has two wives. Uh, there's a, a lot of times there's a stepmother, like in a fairy tale, like Cinderella. You know, she had a mother who loved her, but now her... Now her dad has married an evil, wicked stepmother, you know, with stepsisters who are yeah. jealous. Yeah. Um, that pattern actually has to do with two births. Two mothers has to do with our two births. Uh, you know, you have to be born a second time. There's a physical birth. There's a spiritual birth. All these stories are actually dramatizing some very deep principles that have to do with things that we need, like right in this present moment. It's not about some king who lived 3,000 years ago. It's about you right now. That's that's what I would argue is going on. That's it's that's just what something I, I hear that you know, and I get what you're saying because we're all connected too. So really, I, I honestly, I'm just kind of throwing stuff out there, playing devil's advocate because I think it's it's a uh, it's a good conversation starter. But I think there should be a balance, in my opinion, of you know, self-serving things, self-loving things, and then uh, loving others as well as like a balance of give and take. Like I'm a big balance kind of guy i don't know i just think that's how you get peak energy actually but there's a absolutely, um, abs- absolutely it's about helping others like i said yeah. solomon solomon's question was sorry you were about to say something so I, well i'm just saying I, like yeah it's not a polar idea but they make it out with but you're right we make it out to be sometimes um and we are in an extremely individualistic like it's very easy to, to take things out of balance. So what you said is really important. So Solomon asked for wisdom to help others. That's what I would argue. That's what this connecting with yourself, first of all, it helps you reach your own potential because when we're not connected with self, that's when we are self-sabotaging. Yeah. We've all experienced that. Yeah. But it also helps us to achieve that potential to help others. And you said a beautiful thing about balance. So what... What was, I'm sure you know, but um, if not, I'm putting you on the spot. You may have heard it and it might not be on the tip of your tongue, but let's think about the ancient temple at Delphi or some, some countries call it Delphi, the Oracle at Delphi. That's where, that was one of the most sacred places to touch the divine realm, to hear the voice of the divine. It was the temple of Apollo. Before that, it was belonged to the Python. There's a whole story about that that I can show you is based on the stars. But what, there was two famous inscriptions at the Temple of Delphi that are connected together. They always are mentioned together by these ancient, ancient writers will talk about the inscriptions at Delphi. Do you you know off the top? Yeah. Well, at the Oracle of Delphi, um, it's not like we've dug it up and found these inscriptions, but ancient writers said there were two things that were written there. One was no. Oh. I don't know what's going on with your mic, but it seems like it gets oh. really high and then like cuts off and then I lose you for a second. I don't oh, know. Sorry. Probably I'm gesturing wildly and turning my face in all directions away from my mic. Is it better uh, now? Yeah, it's better. That's what it was. Sorry. Yeah, I was getting all animated. All <laughs> right. So at the, at the Temple of Delphi, the ancient writers about the Temple of Delphi tell us that there were two things that were written there. One was know thyself and one was nothing to excess. In other words, balance. So if the place where you hear the voice of the gods, the place where you go to get in touch with the other realm is associated with two ideas. One of those ideas is know thyself and the other is balance, nothing to excess. Well, those two ideas must be connected. So I think you said a really important thing that this has to be about balance. So right. we want to get, want to know ourselves. 
want to not be polarized. We don't want excess. And that's why, <laughs> and that's exactly what <laughs> these healers of the, like these most cutting edge psychologists are talking about. The problem is our parts all get polarized, but our self can heal them. If you get back in touch with yourself, it can help that basketball team or all those parts get back to their, get out of their extreme roles that they've had to play in this extreme situation and actually be who they are and contribute to the team and depolarize so they're working together instead of against each other and then the team can thrive. They're both connected. You got to get, you got to get yourself to depolarize your parts. <laughs> yeah, that, that's They're good. connected. Yeah. They're connected. Know thyself and nothing to excess are connected in the Oracle of Delphi, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it's just there's some really, I'm telling you, I really think like in, in we just got to be careful about what we take on as beliefs, you know, because I really think it's like, hey, it's a good idea to say, I, this is my theory and like this is what I know based on my intuition and, and I want to study this and keep going like you do with the star myths, which it's telling, which is fantastic because intuitively, what you're talking about feels 100% true to me uh, and based on what I've studied. But then the, you see things like the you know people that do divination and stuff and then there's some that are really tapped in and others that just tell you horrible things. And then there's this other thing that I hear in spiritual movements all the time is like, well, you finally decided to cut out what no longer serves you, you know? And it's like, how is that uh, spiritual? How is that balanced? You cut out everything that no longer serves you but do you not realize like serving others is what serves you i don't know it just seems yeah, backwards to me yeah i mean that's a i think actually we, we actually try and cut out parts of ourself like if we've got a critic trying to tell it to just go away yeah it doesn't work what you have to do is actually and that's See, when Jesus, so to get it back to the myths, not just me theorizing. When Jesus, in the story, in the book of John, the story of doubting Thomas, when, when Thomas says, well, I don't believe it, does Jesus say, okay, Thomas, you're out of here. Yeah, you, no, you don't serve you me. You can't be an apostle yeah, anymore. <laughs> you're done. The other ones believed, and you didn't get lost, take a hike, there's the door. <laughs> he doesn't say that. He doesn't say that. He reacts with compassion. And that shows that the way to heal these different parts of ourself is to actually have compassion and to be loving towards them. Like yourself actually knows how to deal with that part, that doubting Thomas part. And, and just saying, I'm going to use a lot of discipline and get rid of my inner critic, or I'm just going to use a lot of discipline and get rid of this part that always wants to drink. You know, this part of me that this, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to exile it or I'm just uh -huh. going to kick it out. It's not going to actually work. You have to get to the, the bottom of that doubt or that issue. You have to heal what it's actually covering up. Anyway, I think that's, it's a, that's a special story, man. The Doubting Thomas story is very special to me. Like, if it, Jesus is the, is the master, right? The representation of Christ consciousness, the almighty self, God in the flesh, right? The one person, besides Mary Magdalene, that actually got to touch Jesus, his, his breast or his rib, or wherever he touched him in that story, was the guy that said, I need to know. I need proof. The seeker. The one that wanted to know that kept saying, I, I don't, you know, I, he was, I think it was wise actually. This is my take on it, right? Like I've been burned so many times. I need to know that's healthy skepticism. Right. And like he needed to know from a, a, a soul level too. And the, the seeker was the one that got to touch the flesh of Jesus so he could prove it to him. And it shows not only how important seeking is, but also how important compassion is too, like you're talking about, I think. Right, and that, that, you said it perfectly. He had been burned before 
I mean, how did he become doubting Thomas? <laughs> he probably got burned. Yeah. He probably got. He, now he's like, oh yeah, I've seen things that were too good to be true. I've been told things that it seemed too good to be true before, and every time, I got burned. Um, so he's remembering back to the past, or he's thinking out into the future. That's what doubts are, and we have a we have an aspect of our of our you know we're, we're all familiar with that doubting aspect like did i turn off the stove <laughs> after i locked the door yeah, and start driving yeah. down the street uh, i better go back and check there's actually a positive role to that i don't want to burn down the house because i left the stove on that's actually good but we also know that doubts can ruin our life if i'm constantly second guessing myself i'll never accomplish anything because i'm yeah. always doubting so it, it has an important role to play so jesus doesn't say thomas you you worthless apostle and that's a picture of how we're we have a part of ourselves that's been forced into this role of protecting us and and what we want to do is say hey thank you for you know your doubt has actually protected us from problems along the line. That, that's exactly. helped get us to where we are. But I'm here now. So I want you to be one of the members of my team, but I'm the coach. I'm, the, I'm actually the self that actually knows what to do. You want the chariot to be steered by the self, not by doubting Thomas. I'm mixing my metaphors a little bit, no, but in the Bhagavad... Perfect. I'm going to use yeah, that for an audio clip, actually. <laughs> because in the Bhagavad Gita, we have, if you're familiar with the Bhagavad Gita, we have the picture of Arjun. It's spelled Arjuna, but it's usually pronounced Arjun, who is very capable. In fact, he's the most capable warrior in the world. He's got divine weapons. He's got the power, but he is full of doubt. And the Lord Krishna speaks the Bhagavad Gita to him. The whole Bhagavad Gita means the song of the Lord, which the Lord in this case is the Lord Krishna. He's the one who's driving the chariot. Krishna is the non-combatant driver of the chariot. And so who do we want to have driving the chariot? The higher self or <laughs> doubting Thomas? And guess what? <laughs> We've probably all had doubting Thomas driving our chariot more times than we can count and probably is happening right now in lots of our lives and it happens in my life all the time but the more i can have self driving the chariot like trusting like the the other parts saying okay self you be the driver and we'll play our role because we're capable of this and we're capable of that that's the picture that these myths are trying to show us and, and isn't that like if if Jesus is the way kind of myth too? Isn't that showing compassion in like when let's say you're trying to do something for someone else and they doubt, let's say they doubt you, David, right? Like I don't believe you. You're too good to be true. Or this message is too good to be true. Or what you have to offer is too good to be true. And instead of getting all pissed off because they never, you know, just have faith in you, you just have compassion and understanding and you say well here i'll show you i'll have patience i'll give you the proof that you need it's okay i mean what you're saying is a great point when we get get angry like if somebody pushes our buttons it's not because our self is driving the chariot it's some some other part has grabbed the reins and is trying to protect us so you're right when we're acting from self this is what Dr. Schwartz talks about this is what the ancient myths demonstrate. When we're acting from self, if somebody comes up to me and says, you are full of it. You do not know what you are talking about. What is wrong with you? You know, <laughs> yeah. you know nothing. You're I mean, I, and I get, yeah. I get that sometimes. I mean, I get, I get YouTube comments that are sometimes, uh, you know, and I've had people come up to me on the street and say, things that make me literally see red <laughs> and i know i'm not acting you? in self when i see see red. oh yeah oh, dude i so, can't imagine that actually well, you're getting people that can mad. Push your, oh yeah people can push your buttons 
Now, I'm not saying I, you know, hit them, but right. there are the. Have we not? I mean, it's like you feel physical reaction too. It's like the top of your head starts to bubble, mm. with, or you're not you get like burns. this feeling around your heart, right? Yeah, like like yeah. like iron claws are gripping your heart or your stomach or something. The physical reaction that is because our parts of us ha- have control to actually pull levers in the body for sure. But when we're acting in self, those parts. If we say, hey, step back, you know, defending part, I understand that you want to defend us from this insult that we just received, but let's realize that that person, that insult came because that person is, I want to, I want to understand why is that person reacting this way? I want to maybe help them see, you know, I can have, like you just said, the Dr. Schwartz says the self is characterized by compassion and curiosity and courage and all these words that, you know, he uses words that start with C. Um, he's got eight letter C words. Those are, when, when you start acting from self, you actually start to feel those kinds of, you said it, compassion towards someone else. And he has this exercise where he says, imagine someone who really pushes your buttons, someone who really gets under your skin, someone who really causes a reaction to you, in you. And imagine them inside like, a safe room and you're on the outside, but you've got like a window where you can see into it. And it's like one of those windows with like chicken wire within the glass, you know? (laughs) So there's totally safe. Yeah, I guess. And you're looking at them in there and imagine them doing all the things that push your buttons, whatever it is, whether it's, whether it's something that triggers you to want to hit someone or triggers, triggers an emotional response, triggers you to want to do some addictive behavior, whatever it is, you're watching them. And the part of you that jumps up and reacts to that, turn to that part of you and say, hey, I realize you're getting triggered here. Could you just go in this other safe room over here? Or could you go in the waiting room out there? There's nice plants and there's a, uh, some refreshments. Could you just go sit there for a minute? And now turn back and watch that person who's trying to trigger you again. After you've sent that that part of you that got triggered off to wait in the waiting room so you can kind of handle it. And you're watching that person inside that room do whatever it is that triggers you or triggers that behavior. And it's like, do you feel, and tell yourself, we're not going to go in to them right now. We're just going to watch them. All of a sudden it's like you have a whole different feeling towards them. It's like, I wonder I wonder what it is in them that's making them what what happened to her when she was little that caused her to be like that yeah. or you know you feel compassion for them I, I like I've done that exercise in my mind and I'm like wow I wonder what I wonder what it was that happened to that person that caused them to trigger me like that mm-hmm. or to 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 have that behavior that triggers me now that I've sent away for it for the time being the part that got triggered all of a sudden I'm now feeling compassion and curiosity, like what, what is it in them that, that happened? You know, I want to know what, I want to help them. What happened to them? That's yourself. It's not that part. You've, you've, you've separated from that part for a minute that tries to take over the chariot. Anyway, to, to go back to the metaphor of the myths that I, I truly believe that these cutting edge systems that are being used to help people by these therapists today that are very uh, forward-thinking therapists that are very helpful to people are are pictured in the myths and that's that's a big part of what the, the myths are showing us is how to recover our self that can then heal those parts because those parts don't want to be playing that role it's like you can let that part um Whatever it's protecting, once you show it that it doesn't need to protect it anymore because self is here, you can that part. You can say to that part, "Well, what would you rather be doing rather than jumping up and defending me every second? And the other piece of the therapy of the IFS therapy is usually that part is defending an exile, a part of you that has been like locked in a cave or locked in a, a locked away, like some shame. Yeah, it's or the some part of you deep, that needs to be healed for sure. 
that's the part that needs to be healed. The protector is actually keeping you from that because like if you were really wounded as a three-year-old, let's say by your parent, like your dad really let you down, that you really, you really connected with your dad and he did something maybe even unthinkingly to really, you felt betrayed. Well, you don't even want to admit that. You want to say, oh, everything's great with my dad. But actually there's a part that was really betrayed when you were three and you couldn't handle it. You lock that away. And there are myths all over the world about something being locked away, like behind seven locks. Like, don't go behind that door. Do not, whatever you do, please do not go up to the tower and unlock the top door with the seven locks because there's something <laughs> in there that you don't want to find. Well, of course, yeah. <laughs> what happens in the fairy tale? Well, I got to find out. <laughs> as soon as the person who told me that goes away, goes out of town, I'm going to go up and unlock whatever's in that tower. <laughs> well, that's this part that's been locked away, this exile that has to be rescued, that has to be healed and can be healed by the self. But as long as it keeps being locked away, you're going to have these protectors jumping out and saying, don't go up there. Whatever you do, don't go up there. So uh, the, the myths illustrate what's going on in our mind. These modern day healers who have discovered this same truth they may not describe it in mythical language, although if you look at Freud, you know, Sigmund Freud, he described just about everything in mythical language. They're describing this the same truths that have been encoded in these myths since before the time of the ancient Greeks. Like since the ancient Egyptians, since the ancient Mesopotamians, it actually probably came, it's almost certainly came from something even before ancient Egypt. Because if it's already fully developed, think about this. The first ancient Egyptian myths, this is already going on in the myths of Osiris that we find in the pyramid texts, you know, some of the oldest existing texts from Egypt. We find it in the Mesopotamian cuneiform tablets of Gilgamesh or Inanna's descent, very ancient from Sumer. We find it in the ancient Vedas of India. It's already fully developed in all these very ancient civilizations, ancient China. What does that mean? That probably means that those ancient civilizations got it from somewhere even more ancient. Yeah, I totally that's agree with you, man. Yeah, yeah. I forgot. It's been, that's, because that's otherwise been around forever, it, though. You know, like what you're yeah. doing is re is putting the glue in between all of the religions, all of the secret schools, everything. Right? Like if you look at the myths of the stars, it is the it's the thing that runs everything together. It really is. Um, and I wish, I wish that we could get to that point. I think we are, don't you think we're all kind of, we are getting to that point though? Like more, do you think more and more people are starting to realize that, you know, these esoteric truths and these, uh, I would say occult and hidden truths more now than ever before. I feel like that, but I, I ask this question all the time because I wonder if it's not like this RNA or whatever, not RNA, but what? the guest was talking about last night, but because that's what's in my world, I think more people are discovering this. If that makes any sense. I, um, I think what you're describing is or what you're, the way I'm hearing the question is, do you feel like things are more and more people are waking up or do yeah. you feel like more and more? I, I, I see actually two things happening at once. I do see more and more people waking up and I also see more and more, um, trauma trying to be inflicted, you know, with events like 9-11 or with events like, um, you COVID. know, <laughs> COVID or yeah. the assassination of President Kennedy. You know, you hear Kennedy's voice in some of your intro um, uh -huh. theme music. Um, uh, and and those, those uh, the, the assassination of Martin Luther King. So I think we have those two dynamics going on. And I think they are both, the volume on both is turning up because I believe that people, like we were saying, the self, everybody has access to that self. I think people, if in normal, <laughs> non-traumatized people have compassion for others, have say, wait a minute, this is wrong to oppress this way, or this is wrong to say this stream belongs to the mining company and the people who have come down here to gather water for their village for 
thousands of years can't come here anymore. Everybody looks at that and says, that's wrong. Like it, unless you've been, unless you have adopted some really crazy, weird belief system, you don't say, yeah, a mining company can buy a river and exclude everybody else from having that river. Or yeah, it's not right for people to have uh, clean water in their city of Detroit. I mean, that's, that's just, an, nobody thinks that way. Everybody's like horrified if water is not being provided to people. And yet we have water not being provided to people. We have clean water. You know, the Flint, Michigan problem is a travesty. That is, that is a total breaking of the social contract. That is a total, um, you know, non, everybody would look at that and say that is injustice. So the more people wake up to that and get in touch with self, which I think is going on, I think that naturally happens. I think the invisible world, the realm of the gods is working to make that happen. At the same time, the, the people who want to divide you from yourself and keep you from perceiving that are going to try and polarize, polarize, polarize even more. So I think we probably have two volume knobs that are getting dialed up. One is the, the volume knob of people realizing something wrong is going on and I'm waking up to it. And then we have a volume knob of people saying, Hey, we better divide people from themselves so they don't wake up. That's exactly right, man. I've, and it's so crazy because like I'm about to do that. When Ryan's show comes on, we talk about that in there. We talk about it more from a, I, I, I guess we would say a, the, the law of gender and sacred sexuality, how we feel like they're trying to divide that, uh, that part of ourselves. Because anytime I say that, most people think about man and woman relationship stuff that's a part of it too, but it's in the cosmos and it's in everything. And it's also inside you as a person. And they want to divide that part of, of you away too. Like they don't want you to accept these energies inside you that the myths talk about. Do you, do you understand what I'm getting at with that? Like these internal energies, the elemental energies, the gender energies, the things that are naturally inside of you that are working cyclically, that are working in perfect unison Absolutely when they right. started out. But it Absolutely was the doubt right. and all the like, BS that caused everything it, else. Right. It, just like the story of Adam and Eve, and they were naked and they were unashamed. They didn't feel any, uh, you know, they were comfortable in who they are. They, they didn't have to try and be someone else than who they were. The saddest thing in my life right now that I've experienced it's something it's also something inside myself too i'm not gonna lie to you but it's also something that i've attracted into my life in more ways than one are people that i care about that are very close to me uh, whether it's brother family relationship partner potential partner whatever that these everyone wants that deep divine connection with someone else but refuses to have it with himself first, not refuses, just doesn't see that it's there. And then also in situations you have two people that both feel the exact same way about each other, right? You can tell it. If you take it from an observing point of view, if you stand back and look, that they both want the same things. But it could just be so simple if they accepted not just each other, but that energy between them, but instead tearing each other apart, right? And then they're even more hurt. And then they have kids, and that goes on to their kids, and it never ends because we never break the cycle. You see what I mean? It's like there is definitely a force trying to keep that from happening. Or even communities that should be working together, or teams that should be coming together. But they're not because all there's a force out there that wants to divide. It circles back to like what you're talking about. It wants to divide you and tell you, well, you're a bad person and there's something wrong with you, but you, you're, you're cool. Just do what we say, but don't have any type of interaction with anybody. Not too much. You can do it online. That's cool though. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the term shamanic 
it can be overused, misused, misappropriated. Um, but when someone says a shaman in a traditional society, because this is a pattern that is found around the world, it's found in the Altaic, the word itself is from like far northern region of Eastern Asia, Russia, today's Russia, but shamanic practice is found around the world, whether it's in North America, South America, Africa, far northern Europe, um, you know, in the lap land of very far Norway. Uh-huh. It, it is The Bible is actually essentially shamanic. Like I've heard you on some interviews talking about, well, there's passages where it talks about, well, I was in the spirit for three days or I right. was, you know. Okay, so cultures around the world had r- this role of people who healed those those kinds of issues that you're talking about that can become multi-generational issues if they're not dealt with. Like, oh, uh, you know, I see you have, you know, an exile that is, that is, uh, that is being, you know, there's something inside of you that is, you know, this deep shame or this deep hurt that needs to get healed. And traditional societies around the world had these people you know, in enough of a ratio to where there are enough of them to help people to overcome those things. I'm not saying uh, everything was perfect in some imaginary past, but uh, that that role has been stamped out. Like if I said the Bible is essentially shamanic, which I've written a blog post, you know, you can check out my blog and and search for search terms. I, well, well uh, you know what? Actually, we we do got to roll out yeah. of here. So is that, yeah, your yeah, blog yeah, yeah, is yeah, at starmythworld.com? Right. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, if I were to say the Bible is essentially shamanic, people would say, "Ooh, that's heretical." But actually, no, that's just been, it, that 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 role has been stamped out in modern times, but it used to be there to help more people. So yes, um, if people want to check out more star, my my work is about the star myths of the world, and the website is called the the URL is starmythworld.com, and from there you can see you know, some videos, some, there's the blog that's searchable and all kinds of other things there. Yeah, David, it's cool talking to you again. I really appreciate you coming on the show again, man. I love it. I, I really love talking appreciate to you. you having me over. Well, it's, it's like I said, every conversation is different. I, I really appreciate what you bring to the table, Joe. Thank you for bringing, sharing your personal experiences to bring out, uh, you know, different angles that maybe I haven't talked about before. And, uh, I hope that is positive to people who are listening. I hope that is positive to you. <laughs> if you find things on my website or in the things that I say that aren't positive to you, uh, just throw those parts out and just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, hopefully yeah. the, hopefully you can find some positive parts right. and I don't pretend to, to be Wait. a guru who has all the answers. I'm yeah, pointing yeah. people to I their know. own self. You know, that's, who's going to, that's, that's where you got to go. Not to me. <laughs> well, thanks so for if coming I, on. If, anyway. I, if I mess up is, you know, yeah, yeah thanks you're good. Very much. Don't worry. Yeah. They don't think that. Great to talk to you. All right. We got to roll out of here. We got like 10 seconds. So we'll see you guys tomorrow night. Thanks. Good night. Good night.